couple years ago, I found I had a special ability. I can read color hex codes. Hex codes are the six-digit alphanumerical codes that we developers use to set colors every day. My ability is that I can look at the color, excuse me, the code, and from just the code itself, I can tell you what the color is. Now, the reason I can do this is not because I'm some super developer. It's the opposite. I am colorblind. I cannot rely on my own natural color vision. When I look at a color, I can give you a good guess as to what it is, but I can't know for certain unless I have more information. So I learned how to read hex codes out of necessity. And the wild thing is, I thought everybody could do this. Um, my coworkers used hex codes every day just like me, but I was surprised to learn they didn't know the meanings of the characters themselves. So to, to most developers, hex codes are indecipherable, and I wanna fix that. So today I'm gonna teach you how to read hex codes. And I wanna teach you not just because it's some fun developer parlor trick, but by learning hex codes, you learn more than just the hex codes. So I, I wanna acknowledge that there are other better color syntaxes out there. In CSS, we now have RGB, we now have HSL, or if you use a preprocessor, you could do things like set a variable and then use functions on top of that. But hex codes remain the ubiquitous standard. If you want to set a color within CSS, or Photoshop, or a WYSIWYG, or a native app, you'll likely be using a hex code. So let's get cracking. This is the process to read a color hex code. Just five steps, and we're going to go through each step one by one. So the immediate problem with hex codes is that they are optimized for computers, not humans. Hex codes hide their meaning, but we can pull it out. Standard color code is six digits. We'll be working with this one. You'll be very familiar, D49B25. Now, those six digits, they actually represent three things. They're the values of the RGB color channel. So we can break up the six digits into three groups. Now, those three pairs, D4, 9B, 2, 5, those are hexadecimal numbers. That's where the hex in color hex code comes from. So what's hexadecimal? Okay, so when we humans count, we use the decimal numeral system. It has 10 characters, zero through nine, and when you want to count past nine, you have to add a new character, one in front of zero, and you continue counting. 10, 11, 12. Now, hexadecimal works the same way, except it is base 16. It uses 16 characters, zero through nine, and then it uses the characters A through F. In hexadecimal, A is equal to 10, F is equal to 15, and one zero is equal to 16. Hexadecimal came to prominence in computer history as it coincided with the standardization of the byte. A byte in binary is eight digits of zeros and ones. In hexadecimal, you can express a byte with only two digits. So hexadecimal is both concise and computer friendly, thus making it a convention for computer programmers, one that we live with to this day. Now, you don't have to worry about being able to mathematically convert hexadecimal to decimal. For our purposes, all you need to know is the relative value of a single character. So, Zero is the lowest, eight comes around the middle, A, a letter character, is higher than nine, a number character, and F is the highest. And here's that same idea as a line graph. So let's look at our code again. Now that we know that these two-digit pairs are numbers, we can simplify them by rounding them to one digit. So we remove every other character and we get D92. In CSS, this three digit short code, excuse me, this three digit code is called a shorthand. You're likely are already familiar with shorthands and have used FFF for white, 000 for black. The actual value of a shorthand code is made by duplicating the value for each digit. So D92 expanded would be DD9922. This is actually different from the original code that we were working with, but it's ideal for this reading process because it's easier to parse and understand. And that is our first step, the three-digit shorthand. Okay, 
Now we have an easy to digest form of the code, D92. With our basic understanding of hexadecimal characters, we can make a little line graph. This is the second step. All right, so we're gonna map out uh, our code, D92. D would be fairly high, nine comes around the middle, and two is fairly low. And our second step is done. This line graph tells us everything we need to know about the color, but it's in RGB, a color mode that's based around hardware. We need a way to understand the color that's human readable. Having color blindness, I found the best way to describe and understand color and to talk about it with other people is via the HSL model. HSL has three attributes. Hue, which is the pure pigment of the color. Saturation, which is how vibrant or muted the hue is. And lightness, which is how light or dark the color is. The beauty of the HSL model is that it provides a rubric to mix and match words and describe any color in a human readable way. So hue can be described as 12 color names, lightness can be described as light, middle, or dark, and saturation can be described as saturated, washed, muted, or gray. So to describe our color, we just need to select the right word for each attribute and put it together. Okay, so to better understand how hues work in RGB, let's take a look at a color wheel. Digital devices use RGB lights to display colors, red, green, and blue. These are the primary colors for digital displays. Now, the color codes for these colors have the simplest line graphs, where one value is high and the other two are low. So Red, its line graph has high R, low G, low B. Green has low R, high G, low B. Secondary colors in RGB are made by combining two primary colors. Yellow is the combination of red and green. These secondary colors have two high channel values and one low. Yellow combines red and green, so it has high R, high G, low B. Magenta combines red and blue. It has high R, low G, high B. Tertiary colors lie in between the primary and secondary colors. Their line graphs have a high, a low, and a middle channel value. So the hue azure, it's in between cyan and blue. And it has low R, middle G, high B. And finally, if all the channel values have the same uh, value, then that makes a shade of gray. Okay, so we have 12 hues, and each hue has a line graph with a unique shape. When you look at a set of colors that all share the, share the same hue, they may vary in lightness and saturation, but the shape of the line graph remains the same. So here, we're looking at colors that have the hue of azure. And each line graph has low R, middle G, high B. Okay, now to identify the hue of our color, we're going to match up its shape of graph to the hue shape. And we do this by looking at the relative channel values, not what's exact, just basically what's high, what's middle, what's low. With this case, we have high R, middle G, low B. That matches up with the hue of orange. Now, remembering the graphs and shapes for each of these 12 hues can be kind of difficult. It's the difficult part of the process, but it's easy if you remember how the primary and secondary and tertiary colors all work together. And our third step is complete. Next step, lightness. Lightness is how light or dark a color is. We can determine the lightness by looking at the total sum of the channel values. In other words, where the values generally are in the graph. If the values are closer to the top, the color is closer to white and thus lighter. If the values are closer to the bottom, the value is closer to black and thus darker. Our color, D92, it has a mix of high, middle, and the low value. So that averages out to be around the middle. So our color has middle lightness. Step four is done.
Last up is saturation. Saturation is a measure of how vibrant or muted the hue is. We can determine the saturation of the color by looking at its range of channel values. And the range is the difference between the highest and the lowest channel value. Colors with a high range have high saturation. Colors with small range have low saturation. They appear muted or faded. And a color with no saturation, that makes it pure gray. Now, mathematically, there's more going on to calculate saturation, but for our color reading purposes, looking at the range works just fine. Okay, so D92, we're looking at the range here, the difference between the highest and lowest. D is the highest value, two is the lowest. D is pretty high and two is pretty low. That makes for a wide range, but not completely wide. So that's like moderate saturation. So that would make for a washed saturation. And now we have all three attributes to describe our color. And this is the process in and of itself. And we can now distinctly say that D4, 9B25 is middle washed orange. Okay, think fast. Three, Three A five three eight C. Let's do the process here. We got five steps. We know what we're doing. We're gonna first step is get the shorthand. We're gonna uh, remove every other character. We get three five eight. Now we're thinking about the line graph. What do these values actually mean? Okay, three is low. Five comes a little higher. Eight's in the middle. Got our line graph. Figure out the hue from the shape. We have low R, middle G, high B. That matches up with the hue of Azure. <laughs> and now, what's lightness? Lightness is the total, so we look at where the values generally are in the graph. Three, five, eight. Those are low to medium numbers, so that makes for a dark color. And saturation. To figure out saturation, we look at the range, the difference between the highest and lowest value. Three is low, eight is high. The difference between those is there, but it's not a lot. So that would say saturation would be muted. Okay, so 3A538C is dark muted Azure. <laughs> no more tests. All right, so what, you're probably wondering, what about those other digits we, we threw out? We can think of those as fine tuning numbers. Um, so let's look at this code, FF, F2, F0. Now, if we just looked at the shorthand, which is what we've been using, that would give us FFF. But you can kind of see here that this actual color is not pure white FFF. It's something different. So if we look at the secondary numbers, we have this F20. So basically, if you combined the shorthand, which makes up like 90% of the color, with the uh, secondary digits, F20, which is like a red orange, it's like 10%, and it combines to get the result, which is this like very light beige. So those secondary numbers, they're useful for subtle desaturated colors like beiges and pastels. But for the large majority of colors we use, all you really need is the three digit shorthand color. So MailChimp just released their rebrand. It looks great. And sure enough, their brand colors use the standard six digits. Nearly all of these colors can be changed to the three-digit shorthand equivalents, and there's hardly any visual difference. Using shorthand codes comes with several benefits. The first is that they're easier to read as colors, because at a glance, you can match up each character with its RGB channel. So you understand what that color or code actually represents. They're easier to remember. And here, I'm going to close my eyes for this next part. Because my, my own brand colors, I've memorized them because I use them so often, and I use shorthand codes. So I can list them off the top of my head here. So garnet is C25, gold is EA0, blue is 19F. And I've become so familiar that I don't have to reference the brand guidelines, because it's just three characters. Shorthand codes are easier to choose because it's like you're aligning a color palette to a grid. The full wet gamut uh, color palette is 17 million colors. Shorthand codes gives you about 4,000 colors. That's still a lot, but 
With that limitation, your choices are more distinct, more deliberate, so it's easier to choose between. And finally, once you know how to read um, uh, color codes, you can then start changing shorthand codes to the color that you want. Let's work with this one, D92, which is the orange we figured out. Okay, what do we need to do to make it lighter? You'd bump up the numbers. Make it darker by bumping down the numbers. Desaturate it by bringing the range closer together by moving the high number down and the low number up. Or change the hue by changing the order of the characters. So I encourage everybody to go back to your company and without telling anybody, change your colors to shorthands. <laughs> Visually, no one is likely to notice, but if they do, you then have an opportunity to teach them how to read color codes. <laughs> Pass it on. So uh, this leads me to my final point. Front-end development is filled with tools and frameworks. You know, React, Webpack, SAS, Bootstrap, Babel. And these tools are useful because they allow you to operate at a higher level. You don't have to get your hands dirty working with those smaller details. But by relying on tools, it comes at a cost. Because at that high level, you start missing some of the small details. And there's a lot to learn there. Right? Like, by looking into hex codes, you learn about hexadecimal, HSL, shorthand codes. It led me down this path where I'm not just, I'm not just worrying about the color code, I'm now thinking about larger concepts. I'm thinking about productivity, I'm thinking about how short codes can affect my workflow. So tools are great to get that big, grand, macroscopic view, to get you to that higher level. But it's also useful to have a microscopic view, to scrutinize every character of code you write. Because when you think about your craft at the smallest levels, it's another way you can gain insights to understanding that big, wide view. Thank you.